spotlight on the investments in women-led companies by other female investors. We wanted to continue the conversation about funding and the different ways in which women can get funding. So hence, we've launched with Springboard the Women Funding Women series. Sharing those stories, talking about how you do it, and really helping those female entrepreneurs who are starting to think about funding, but there's lots of different ways about how you get your funding. One of the things that we love about our relationship with Dell is that it is a global engagement. So we have developed this global network of over a hundred business owners that have begun to do business together and we've brought in a lot of Springboard alumna into the process to benefit from it. You can't build a business in a vacuum. You have to have a network and you have to constantly be reaching out and expanding your network. And it's the power of the network where they lend their credibility to help accelerate your time to achieve success. If that's an introduction to an investor or an introduction to a potential customer, when the network puts their weight behind you, it can speed up your chance of having success within those new introductions. Angel investing is all about trust and certainly Carolyn entered the company or joined the company investment round uh, based on having had a long-term relationship with, with myself. So a big thing that I've learned over the 20 plus years being an angel investor is it's about the people and the trust. So knowing somebody, um, in our case we knew each other very well, it was, it was just an easy thing for me just to kind of say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll invest. And Carolyn has continued as a, an advisor to our company. And so the power of the relationship is that not only do you meet these people that become angel investors to you, but you get their networks as well. I think the power of the fireside chat is that people in the audience actually know that it can happen. And that when you actually can hear, you know, the stories behind how they gives them hope that, you know, it's not impossible to get funding, but two, to actually be able to do a deeper dive and actually understand how did the business first come about, how did the investor first get connected, how long they've been doing this. I think all of that is definitely value added because one of the people that was in the audience raised a question about, hey, I would love to invest, I just don't know how. And Everyone up that was presenting during the fireside chat immediately had a response because they have all this knowledge and all of these contacts and networks that they could bring all the people together. And so just the fact that you know they bring that credibility and that experience and they lend their voice to it is very, very inspirational for everybody in the audience who's looking for funding. These kind of events are absolutely vital to help promote uh, women and, and encourage uh, more younger women entrepreneurs to step forward, to lean in, to become CEOs of large organizations. It's just overall good for the economy. Dwen is the Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network. It's a global network for female founders around the world. It's about connecting the women, because that's absolutely crucial. It's about helping them to get access to capital and it's also about getting access to technology and making sure they're using the right technology that will help grow and scale their companies. We have a global event once a year which moves location around the world. We've been to Shanghai, Delhi, Rio, Austin, Berlin, Istanbul and I'm absolutely thrilled to say we're coming to Toronto in July 2018. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great day to be in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest. Are you all excited to be here? You know, I'm thrilled to be here um, helping to host the Women Funding Women event. My name is Bobby Dangerfield, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Business Services at Dell. And we have some really great speakers and presenters lined up with us this afternoon, and um, I personally can't wait to hear from all of them. You know, entrepreneurs are really the engine that drives the global economy. If you think about it, um, globally, startups account for about 70% of net new jobs, and in some emerging markets, it's 91%. And that's incredible. And that's why Dell continues to invest in entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs. And as the visionary outcome of a true entrepreneur, uh, Dell supports and continues to nurture a community of female entrepreneurs by providing access to technology, 
capital, and networks. If you think about technology, our mission is focused on really enabling human potential. And we do that through technologies to help support and, and enable our customers to, um, to do just that. From a capital standpoint, um, according to Kanze, only about 2% of VC funding goes to women entre entrepreneurs. But interestingly enough, women entrepreneurs make up about 38% of the overall landscape of, um, of the entrepreneur environment. The good news is, is that VC funding it now represent, for women now represents 7%, which is up from 2014 when it was, uh, was 3%. And the numbers are lower even globally. If you think about networks, um, you know, professional women sometimes find it hard to break into the male-dominated um, world of uh, in investing and venture capitalists, and they, so they turn to each other for help. And that's why we're here today. We're, see we're going to see how women funding women can really help the, the economy. And that's why we're also a part, proud to be a partner with Springboard Enterprises for these Women Funding Women series. You saw in the video that we do these all over the world. And we're very excited, as I mentioned, to be in, here in Dell's hometown of Austin, Texas for South by Southwest. And in 2017, the Dell Women Entrepreneurs Cities Index, or We Cities, um, the only global gender-specific index that looks at De a city's ability to attract and foster growth for women-owned firms, found that Austin ranks number 15 out of the top 50 cities for women. So I think that's awesome. Uh, evidently, Austin's doing something right. But we all know that more can be done. And that's why Dell is proud to sponsor events like this one and um, in, in giving access to networks and organizations like Duane are so, so important. And I'm also excited to announce that later this spring, we will be announcing that uh, in Austin, we'll be launching the Austin chapter of the Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network. And we're very, very excited about that. If you have any questions, you can talk to me or any of the Dell folks here later on in the, in the event. So now I'm excited to bring to the stage my friend and colleague, Trissa Thompson, who's Dell's Chief Sustainability Officer. And Trissa is going to moderate a fireside chat with Karen Moon, who is the CEO and founder of Trendalytics, and Lauren Flanagan, co-founder and managing partner of Bell Capital USA, both whom are very good friends of Dell and Dwen. So please uh, join me in welcoming Trissa to the stage. Bobby. Oops, sorry. Hi, thank you all for being here. When she was talking about the We Cities Index, I think you'll be entertained to find out that the top city in the world for female entrepreneurs was New York City, and that even they got a D. So the top city is a D. So we've got a little bit more work to do in that area. Well, without further ado, because the main part is not listening to me, the main thing we want to do is listen to Lauren, and we want to listen to Karen. And I'm going to have them tell you a little bit about themselves, so I won't take the time for the introduction. So please, warm welcome. Grab your water. Or do you want me to sit? Oh, in the middle. All right. My Lauren and I go way back. She's been at all of the Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network summits. I think all of them, actually. I, everybody um, except Shanghai. Every, uh, everyone but one. And we're, da we're dancing buddies. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> There, yeah, perfect. Now I can see you better. So Karen, let's just do our, our own introductions. Tell us a little bit about your business and how you got started. Great. Um, so my name is Karen Moon, co-founder and CEO of Trendalytics. Um, long story short, what we do is we help, we're a big data platform that helps brands and retailers make more informed decisions about product development and merchandising. Um, my background has actually been in retail and the problem um, I, I saw in the marketplace is something that I firsthand experienced in my past job. So traditionally we look at data looking backwards to project forward, but customers are very fickle, um, you know, there's missed opportunities. And so what we did is um, when I met my co-founder, we found an opportunity to look at all the externalities that impact the business. When you look at the apparel market, which is where we started, it's about one point trillion dollars and they have about a hundred problem because they can't predict um, and forecast trends. So we came up with a special 
Of course, we love anyone who's doing big data and really not only having it, but using it in a really productive way. Because as our, our team says, big data is just a cost. I guess it's like you smarter data, not with so big, but smaller. <laughs> smaller, but smarter. smarter. Yeah. And Lauren, how did you get into being, you know, Bell Capital? <clears throat> well, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur and uh, actually bootstrapped my first few companies till I went to Springboard and I was in their first program. I met Amy and Kay in 1999 and was able to raise more than $20 million for my company at that time, which ultimately sold. So I'm one of their statistics, if you don't know. Uh, 700 women-led companies raised $8 billion in capital. We've had more than 80% of the companies are still in business all these years. Actually, this is my idea of heaven. <laughs> I'm on a mission to help women invest and help women entrepreneurs succeed. My mantra is we women are the solution to our own capital access problem. And nobody walks a walk Love it. more than Dell Love with it. Dwin and what they do for women entrepreneurs. And we're here in this exciting city. And look at this room full of people that care about this issue and our great men who are supporting us. And this is one of my portfolio companies that I'm so proud of at Bell Capital. So, I mean, what could be better? Maybe a drink in the hand, but other than that, it's good. <laughs> later, later. And so, Karen, when we were prepping for this, we had a great conversation about when you started out, I know you went to a lot of different investors. And you, so you really had a conversation about how do you narrow that down? How do you really get smart about your investment? Tell, us, tell the group, because I know they're all looking for funding somewhere. How, how did you so, do that? Um, we, we're a seed stage company. We've done a couple of rounds of funding. The last round was around $3 million, but in total we raised $6.5 million. Um, my first, part, first cycles of funding was very different from my second ones. I think when I was starting out, um, you didn't want to hear no. It's like your baby, and you almost want to convince everyone that this is like the best idea. Whereas in the, you know, and it was very personal. Whereas the second time around, um, one, we were operating, we had revenue, we had customers, and I didn't have time. I had, fun, although fundraising is supposed to be a full-time job, I have no capacity for it. We had customers and things to do. Also, I didn't want to waste my time, and I didn't want to convince someone. So I actually was much more targeted. There was a lot of investors I didn't go to. It was really important to target get the right stage, fit, um, sector expertise, because honestly, you don't want just capital. You want someone to join your team and to be helpful to you, because um, there's some of our investors, and also Springboard as well, you know, who doesn't have an investment in the company, but I think of them like our investors or in all our investor updates. They're kind of like our extended team. So, you know, when you find a boyfriend or get married or all these different things, you want to interview the person. You kind of want to bring that type of mentality to who you have on your investing team. I think it's critical. So the second time around, we had a different pitch, but we was very focused. And if I got a feeling that the person wouldn't be helpful, they weren't passionate about what we were doing, then I stopped wasting my time. I thought um, something else you said that was really interesting was that you don't take every investor. Sometimes you just say no. And to oh, yeah. me, that would be so hard. I'm like, wait, no, yeah, I got this one, right? So how, how do you just say we're not ready or that's not the right fit? All right. So um, I think also one of the things that was important is I wanted to control the process. Um, so instead of, we actually had a decent number of investors. We um, Luckily through, I was, I was in Springboard, I was part of the New York Fashion Tech Lab. This was about four years ago, and that's actually how Lauren and I had met. But um, there's all these other opportunities that we've still received to date, you know, years later. And so because of the press, we've gotten opportunities like participating in an RF. Um, we've actually got a lot of investor interest inbound. I get emails a lot. Um, but there's no point in starting a process if you're not ready. So of course I selectively take meetings to build a relationship, but there was a couple of investors that were pretty aggressive about trying to start early, but I knew I wasn't ready, so I actually pushed back and said we're not fundraising yet. And um, that helped me become more prepared. So I knew that I wanted a diligence room ready, I knew I wanted my deck in place, like, you know, I wanted to be thoughtful about the package that I um, put together, and I didn't want someone else to control that process. I um, was careful that we had everything ready to go so that we could condense the time cycle and, and move really quickly and then also not get distracted in terms of operating the business. But one thing you did really well was you kept in contact with us and you kept giving us reports and updates. So when we first looked at you, we thought you were a little early for our sweet spot. 
but you kept saying, here's how I'm doing, here's how I'm progressing, this is what I, where I am now. And so we already felt we had some confidence before we even began the process because you did a great job communicating. So that's a key tip. You want to have a relationship with those investors before you start asking them for money. So that is a great segue to my next question for you, which is, was it love at first sight? How did this relationship get going? Oh, well, we always knew she's brilliant and talented, so there was no <laughs> doubt there. That's my co-founder, not me. <laughs> Own it. Come on, you're brilliant. In fact, you were very modest. You're a superstar at Gap. When I did her background checks, you know, and talking about her interviews, they're like, she would have been one of the top people at Gap if she'd stayed through all the brands. She was doing the innovative stuff of doing some online, but she, you know, went off and did her MBA and, and uh, she became an entrepreneur. So she was definitely a star. Uh, we love the company, but at Bell, we are very specific, and this is another tip for you. You need to make sure that the companies that you, or the investors that you're talking to, that they invest in your sector, at your stage, and in your geography, and in the amounts that you need. So we are a very Series A investor. We want to see revenues. We want to see growing revenues. We want IP. We want a pretty well-formed team. And so we have a, you know, criteria where it's on our website, which your company met, but it took a while. So we watched as they progressed until we started to see, it took a while to break through with the platform to really go from early adopter to seeing that this was gonna be something that could be mass adopted. So it wasn't love at first sight, but it was admiration and following. You dated? We dated, we dated before we got married. So I do have a question about that because there's a lot of people in the room that they're thinking, okay, how do I even find who, which investor would be interested in my product? How do you go about even Figuring, that's actually for both of you, figuring that out. Well, like I said, it depends on which stage you are and how much money you need to raise and what kind And then you might be ready for a venture round. Um, so it depends on how much total capital you're going to need to have your company perform at its peak. And so there, it's not an easy answer to that question, yeah. but it takes a lot of your point, you don't want to waste your time. I mean, you're really wasting your time and the investor's time if it's not the right sector or not the right stage. You want to make sure that both of you are aimed at the same target, and then you can be highly efficient and productive as you were. You were like on it. Yeah. So how did you start to narrow down that pool? Um, I think, to be honest, it was easier the second time around. So um, I guess the lessons I learned there, I wish I had known. But there's, um, luckily, being a part of different networks like Springboard or Accelerator programs, where there's a lot of really great um, informal groups, even in New York, for female entrepreneurs, which is so helpful. But um, there's different lists of investors, and I thought that was a really great way to get started. So there's a lot of research you can do online around Crunchbase and things like that. So that research process is incredibly important. And so there's a couple of criteria I looked at. One, are they focused on our stage, you know, seed, like, you know, how many deals have they done? I actually look at their portfolio. If they're invested in a conflicting portfolio company, don't waste your time. <laughs> like, there's just no point. Um, two, um, like, there's even lists that show who's recently raised money. And so it's important to think about the investor's shoes, too. Angels obviously have different types of capital, but I also looked at, for our lead investor, are they active? Like, how many active seed investments do they do or do they do one seed deal you know at a time and so it was really important to understand if they're really playing in your space and then how much dry powder they had so I took a much more scientific approach um, to fundraising the second time around now one of the things you told me in terms of perfecting the message is that early on they all just thought you were like high-end retail and that you weren't you didn't have a broader application potential and that you had to kind of tweak your message a little bit so this is, this is kind of funny. I think Lauren always jokes that she gave me a hard time <laughs> when we were like doing the process. Um, I did. <laughs> I, it wasn't so bad. Um, it, it's funny, like if an investor is not asking you more questions about your business, then you've got to question like their diligence process. I'm actually, I respect investors who ask tough questions because um, they're really getting to know your business, but it also helps you think how they think, right? And so um, I think that, balance is really important. Um, yeah, I mean, and so, um, like, you know, as far as the pitch, when we first started, we got a lot of press as a fashion company, and um, really, I think even some investors 
you know, who didn't take the time. They just, it was more of a perception thing, but they thought like, oh, that's a really cute business. You must like, like love to shop, you know, um, which was really annoying because no matter how many decks where I took the pink out, you know, I changed my images to be like more like um, unisex versus like, a, you know, like a type of purse that they just wouldn't understand, you know, or something that just like would kind of put a, a you know, blocker on. So like, um, I kind of thought about all these different things and I even had like market sizing, like, you know, I'm pretty analytical. So, and I've been an investor in my past, so I knew what they needed to see. But even despite that, and you show market expansion and all these other things, they still thought I was a fashion company and not a data company. It wasn't until um, we were top 10 in Google's machine learning competition last year. And it also taught me how to pitch our business differently from a technology and data science perspective. And so um, that kind of helped. It was a learning lesson for me too in terms of how we really talk about our business in a differentiated way. But um, sometimes it takes a lot for certain people. I think they you know, look at your 10 page jack or they just have a perception of your pitch and they're, they make judgment calls really by what's on the cover sometimes instead of d d diving deeper. And it's the investors that really dug deeper to understand our core technology and to understand where we are differentiated and that we're doing semantics and rankings and all these different things that are pretty complex and cutting edge and that we had a very unique approach. So even the second time around, like we had several Fortune 500 customers, we had SaaS metrics that were above average, but some people were still just, you know, not getting it. And um, probably part of that's my pitch maybe, but I think a lot of it was, you know, kind of just having a point of view on the sector and not like, I think a lot of times investors get pitched so often that it takes them a while to like listen sometimes. Best yeah, for but for us, it was the tech, not the fashion. So we love you've the, got a SaaS background. I have a so. SaaS background. I was all about the tech. It was like, despite the fashion, right? I was pushing to know, could you put it to other industries? And I pushed you a lot. I know I drove you crazy, but you were very gracious uh, about you know, enterprise integration. Because if you could uh, integrate with the big players who have the historical inventory, the point of sale systems, that's what world domination looks like in your market. Mm -hmm. And so I always want to know what does world domination look like in a market because they have the potential to do it. And so the, how were the APIs? How were, you know, so I asked you a lot of questions like that. Did I drive you crazy? Sometimes. <laughs> A question for you, Lauren. So, what is it when you meet someone who's doing a pitch for it? What are you looking for? What are your expectations? Well, first of all, it's the people, the jockey. I mean, Karen and her team are extraordinary. She was a superstar at everything that she's done. So, you start with that. And then we're looking for uh, companies that can be big, you know, that can dominate or disrupt markets that have uh, the technology that's really differentiating. And, and they don't have to all be unicorns. Of course, we'd love to have that. But if you get in at the right price, the right terms, you can do very well in companies that you know sell where the hot spot hot spots are for a minute. And do you want to see like a social cause? Do you want to just see really strong financials? Money, 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 money. And if you can, and if you can help the world, good. <laughs> no, no, that's that's important. I mean, I'm a capitalist. It's all about making money. And we women can do a lot more when we make a lot of money, and we can pay it forward and do good things and invest in other women. Everybody here can do that. Yeah. And how did? Yes, exactly. How did, um, how did investors help you, if at all, get introduced to, to potential customers? Um, actually, really helpful. So um, we're still pretty small in certain areas, and especially in sales, but we've been able to break through to a lot of the top companies. Almost a lot of our companies are Fortune 500 um, companies, and um, a lot of that has been through referrals from investors. Um, we have a lot of channel partnerships, so one of our biggest things right now is actually partnering with larger software companies um, to do what we want to do next, and it's all of that's come through our investor base. And so I think that's why it was really important for us to choose our investors who really understood staff, who brought different ideas to the table where I'm, I'm negotiating a very very complex um, contract right now and I can pick up the phone and call them because they've actually done this before. They've worked at Oracle or have built you know, a top 10 enterprise software company and so that's critical because then they help you with your success. And I think Lauren brought up such a good point like, you know, as an entrepreneur we have to also think about servicing our investors. Like, 
the more returns, the higher ROI they have in my company, then they're gonna make more investments in other companies, right? And they also have LPs. And so it's like sometimes we have to think about like, what is an investor looking for? How can you kind of be more on the same page on that? And that actually helps build a better relationship. Yeah, in fact, we had one of our uh, limited partners is on our investment committee, Renee Lorton, who's been an active member of Fashion Tech Labs. She used to be at Oracle. She's really an expert in enterprise software, and she's been advising you and, and on uh, your observer to your board. And that's what we try to bring through our group at Bell. It's not just a check, but all of our investors are women. 100% are women, and they're all uh, entrepreneurs or executives. And so they bring their human capital, their know-how, and, and to help these companies. So we try to find who's the best person in our uh, fund to help our portfolio company. So Renee is really works more closely with you than I do, but I was, you know, key in the investment decision. Well, everywhere we go, I have to say, and this is where it's like you're bringing someone onto your team. She's like, hey, have you met this company? Have you met this company? And then she'll like kind of make introductions. So these are the people you want on your side. Absolutely. Now I want to like have a real conversation about the money dance. So you're going to give her some money. You need money. Do you guys see eye to eye on where that money should be spent? Is there a conversation about that? Of funds. <laughs> yeah, I think it's incredibly important to um, know how much you're raising, what you're going, to, what milestones you're going to hit within that time frame before you need the next round, or you're getting to profitability. So having very clear milestones and a believable plan and projections on how you can execute on that, I think is incredibly important. No matter how great the idea, it's all about execution. So I think as an entrepreneur, sometimes those things are really hard to do on your own or if you don't have business background, but there's so many um, different types of like office hours and people you can ask, like before you really pitch someone, it's critical to get feedback on your pitch and if it's a believable plan, because you also want to make sure you can execute on it and that you beat your plan, right? The last thing you want to do is set unrealistic expectations and fall short, so, but I feel like it's a hard balance. To be honest, like I've, yeah. sometimes I, I, a lot of my actual female um, investor friends say that women sometimes undersell. Um, I know this is true of me sometimes as well. Um, whereas sometimes, the stereotypically, you know, men have more bravado, and so, or maybe that's not the right word. But sometimes there's it, there is this balance, right? How do you create something, but you don't want to be too conservative. You have to have a big vision that people get excited about, you know. And you don't want to. I think there's definitely parts that you want to be conservative, but there's parts that you want to sell the big vision. And then if you think too small, are you ever going to get there? So I think there's a really hard balance sometimes. And I don't know what the perfect answer is, but I think that's incredibly important. And Lauren, how do you control is it? Is it a contractual thing saying the funds can be used for X or how, do, how does that work from no, Well, you usually agree on what the use of funds are and um, have budgets and so forth. But no, we don't micromanage the investments. We're trying to back the team that really is going to, you know, execute and do what they think is right. But I think your point is really spot on. I mean, what I love about women-led companies is they tend to be you know, realistic about where they are, as opposed to a lot of, whether it's bravado or, you know, over-exaggeration. But it's also important that you have what's, what is the moonshot? What does world domination look like? What if you were wildly successful? What would that mean? And what would be the three big drivers for that? And which partners would you need to bring in to make that happen? So one of the things that you did that was so great is your lead investors were really important strategic uh, allies in this. And then we have people on the board going to watch the money. So the other thing that I also do with the money is what does the exit look like? Um, how are we yes. going to make money? Yes, and I, times. I, I, oh I, <laughs> <laughs> I made her make lots of charts because she used to be an investment banker. So I was like, okay, who's going to buy you and why? And well, what the are the drivers? Thing about this is that I was an investment banker and I knew that they had, we always had to do this work for other people. So then I reached out to all the emails I got from other investment banks trying to pitch me. And then I just had them do all the work. It's all about <laughs> delegating. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> now that actually raises another question because you, you don't have just one investor, right? You're managing a portfolio a, so kind of from both of your perspectives Lauren how do you deal with the other investors and how do you manage them all because you get them you like you got a lot of bosses right yeah well that's a key diligence point is is there alignment among all the stakeholders you know you want to have investors that are going to have your back they're going to you know help you through thick and thin because it's not a straight line it's a lot of squiggles to get there right so 
And then you need to have alignment amongst those investors about how much total capital and what's the exit and do we think these are the key things. And so that's a very important point is talking to those other investors because if you don't have alignment or, for example, it's at the end of a fund's life, uh, then they're not going to put more money in. You know, that could be a problem in the next round of funding. So there's alignment about how much capital, what the exit is, the timing of it, who's going to participate at which round. I mean, we're really clear. We're Series A. We're not really a Series B, so you can't count on us for deep pockets, but we'll help syndicate. We'll bring our network to do it. So that alignment is essential um, in managing and syndicating rounds. And I think a lot of an, um, entrepreneurs, like earlier first-time entrepreneurs don't think about this, but I think that's such an important point. Like I've had friend, I had a, a, a friend of mine um, who raised a Series A, had a hundred million dollar exit opportunity. Great, would be great ROI for all of her, for her founding team, her early investors. But they had a big investor involved, and um, for that fund, it didn't matter to them. It was like go big or go home. And so, although he didn't control the board, it definitely dominated the conversation on the board. And so they ended up not selling. And I don't know how the company's doing now, but that was a really good opportunity. And so it's about being aligned with investors on that. So if, like, um, like what is the bigger opportunity? Like, do we continue to grow? And for me, it depends on the stage and like how the market changes and evolves. But you know, having investors that would be okay or happy with a $30 million, $100 million exit, obviously if it happens sooner rather than later, you know, and the, the economics make sense, you know, but, um, being aligned on that, I think, is incredibly important. So it's your job to make sure they're aligned. How do you, how right. do you bring them all in a room? Well, I also leverage our investors to speak with each other. And that was part of the diligence process because they wanted, it was almost like you're all joining a team. And so um, I was looking at almost creating a portfolio. So I did look at my investors as a team. We have an, um, a SaaS element of our business. We have, a, you know, an enterprise software like that's more complex like you know because we work with larger companies and I knew I was going to start doing channel partnerships and integration so I wanted people with that experience and then also industry experts so um, we actually have a number of industry veterans who founded like you know like Laura Mercier or former CEO of the Gap you know we brought in different types of people and so I kind of looked at my investors as a portfolio of, um, or not a portfolio, but like as a team, an extended team of who can I go to for different types of things. And I think that also helped give confidence to different investors coming in. Another question I had for you guys is I, but and as I do I've, put them to work. Oh, right. <laughs> Some of them. Some when, of them. I work, <laughs> when I talk to female entrepreneurs, a lot of questions they have are like, I need to have the right lawyer to do this. Um, who should be a financial partner that I can trust to work with? Not just the investors, but you know the banking system. How did that work between you guys or, or, or with other investors? Did you get advice and recommendations on who to hire? Mm -hmm. um, I think hiring's the toughest part. And um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Like I think right now, head of sales is like, if anyone's looking for a job, head of sales. <laughs> this is a winning company. <laughs> um, but that's a really tough one. And understanding yeah. where the market is, um, you know, um, also how to interview the right talent is really incredibly important. And also the referral network that they have from their portfolio companies. And so that's an example where, you know, I haven't done that before and so other people to give me feedback because it's just like the type of hire that you don't want to get wrong. So I'm finally building out an executive team and being able to, one, have a broader extended network um, to, you know, kind of do recruiting and to reach out to people, but also to actually help with the interviews to make sure our compensation structure is in line with the market um, is like incredibly important. And so this time around, I had someone I was really um, kind of interested in. I thought his expectations were like, grossly out of market, but I was able to do a quick, you know, email to a bunch of my investors and like we really kind of started to triangulate on what made sense or not. And now I'm actually, I created a steering committee on helping me with this. <laughs> and so, you know, but, but it's helpful to get those different points of view. So you're not isolated making a decision like that on your own and you can really bounce ideas and move faster. I feel like um, indecision is like the worst, but when you have people you trust who are good at what they do, then you can make better decisions faster and like there's not enough time in the day. So I think that's critically important. So that was a key how, how use of about funds that? was to develop her commercial team so they could grow faster. And also we wanted people who could do channel partners and enterprise sales. Mm -hmm. So that's a hard thing to do and recruit, but that's what we wanted to happen and that's where the money's being used. So how do we pick attorneys? 
Well, we have a great network uh, through Bell and also through the springboard of 5,000 experts. There's a lot of great attorneys and financial uh, folks there. But in your case, you had good health in, the, in those areas. So we didn't, I mean, sometimes we But you need, keep a Rolodex. So if someone has that question, you've got. We do. We give them usually a few choices. Advice. We don't say only call this person. We say here's a few that we think would be right and do your own diligence. But. Yeah, there's, there's and what's good about that is then when you have an investor base that has a portfolio, they have real experience. So they have experience with the partner at X law firm and, you know, will, you know, have an understanding or X recruiter. And that just makes it so much easier. You know, like it takes away, it eliminates any risk. Yeah, so let's go back a little bit to an earlier stage because I really think it's interesting the value of organizations like going through the boot camp with Springboard. I mean... You know, sometimes some people I think don't want to take the time to go do that and invest that time. So tell me about that. And it's not just a shameless plug for Springboard, but <laughs> I think that, that it, it matters when you start thinking about how do you get how do you get started? Yeah, uh, I think um, accelerators and networks are just incredibly, um, incredibly important. Um, it's just so helpful. Like you really do need a village to get started, and when you can have a group where you can ask questions on, hey, do you guys have a PR firm? Or, you know, there's these forums that everyone's on that you can get quick answers and referrals, you know, really fast. That's helpful, you know, moving at any stage, actually. But in the early stages of really figuring out and honing your pitch, your product market fit, someone who you trust to actually ask the hard questions before you go pitch an investor is incredibly important. And, um, like, it's... Even though you can meet with investors and they say like, oh, we'll give you informal feedback, they're constantly judging you and they're constantly making a decision. And so sometimes if you go too early or you haven't flushed out an idea, um, you know, you're better off doing that in a safer place because you can meet with a random investor and they'll have one conversation. They're probably talking half the time of what, what their ideas are without really understanding what you want to do or your business. But then when you're in part of an accelerator program where you have multiple investors coming in, where you have like, you know, a partnership of people helping you throughout that, then they get to know you, your business, what your goals are, and what you're really trying to achieve at the most formative phases, and that's invaluable. Makes sense. And Lauren, you've got some experience there, obviously, as well. Well, yeah, I was in the first class of Springboard, and it was invaluable to me. And it's more than just that. It's, it's really um, a powerful network. I mean, 19 years later, these are still some of my best friends. I've been on the board. I look for companies from Springboard to invest. Sorry. And that's okay. It's fine. I look for them to invest in because I know they're vetted. And uh, there's just many lifelong entrepreneurs in that group. So it's a fantastic group to, it's like your alumni organization maybe in a school, but more specific because these are other women walking in your shoes who understand what you're going through. And there's really nothing as powerful as a peer network. And, uh, and the Dwen network is the same in that way too. Yeah. You know, having the, the peer networks uh, is, I think is really powerful and, and great support to, as you said, get feedback before you talk to those investors. Am I crazy? How does it sound? Do you get it? I mean, those things are good. Yeah, and even the New York Fashion Tech Lab, like within our cohort and actually other cohorts, I've become very good friends with, you know, um, women in the two classes below me and like we, have non-competing products, but we're pitching the same company where we like yeah. meet and call each other on like how the negotiations went and giving each <laughs> other advice and personalities. I mean, like this gives us an edge when women are really helping women and not competing with each other. You just realize like how much further we can get together. And so um, I think I've developed a lot of really strong friendships as a part of the network. I think that's great. Um, so I know we just have a little bit of time, but I'm curious, how do you know when you're finished fundraising? <laughs> well, so the other thing is, I guess you're never finished fundraising, but I think it's really easy to constantly be fundraising and forget about the business. I know people always take an investor's meeting all the time. I think it's okay to say no. I think it's actually really important to say no sometimes and, like, use time wisely. So, because um, you have to operate a business and you have to... That, you know, like, that's a really important piece. Like, if you do that well, then the money will come. And so um, I think it's really important to kind of engage different types of investors in different ways. But, like, I definitely 
Like, so for example, at a certain stage, you'll get a lot of growth equity investors calling. I know they're not going to invest in me now. Do we want to have a relationship? Sure, but it's an analyst that's probably going to move or be somewhere else. And so I kind of <laughs> use those kind of meetings in very different ways where I won't take a call because I don't have time. I'd rather spend that time with my customers or, you know, um, coaching my employees or getting the business further. But then I might say, oh, come to this, like, conference and let's chat for a few minutes. You know, there's like different ways to do it. Um, so um, I think that's important though. And I think it's really important to say no sometimes and figure out how to use your time wisely. I was going to ask your, your point of view on that too. Well, or... yeah, I mean, you got to know your total amount of capital and who you're going to get it from along the way. So that's important to have your capitalization plan. But this will be kind of a tip as we're winding up here. What I really liked about you is you've always been really organized and disciplined. You can hear that in how she says no and how she uses her time. I mean, she made a really key point early on that her deal room was ready. Her references were stellar. She'd called everybody recently and, you know, brought them up to date. So, you know, when you asked for that list of references, it was like top people who knew her for years and could even tell you what the business was doing. So that showed she had relationship. Her pitch, her materials, her comps, all of that were first rate. That's called doing your homework, you know, that you are really prepared when you're asking for money. And, and as an investor, you really respect that when the entrepreneur does that. That's probably the number one. There are two main mistakes entrepreneurs make. They pick the wrong investor who's not right for them. They're wasting their time and theirs. And number two, they're not ready. And so whatever it takes to get ready is what you got to do. And you've got to always fundraise, but from the right people. Rifle shot. And there's just some ways to do it, like keeping people up to date is a great way. I, I feel like I don't do it as well as I should, but um, your, sometimes... Your investor reports are great every quarter. It's but awesome. I mean, and, and then other investors, <laughs> if you like, you know, actually LinkedIn is an way, amazing way to um, keep people in touch. I, I, you don't realize like how many people are looking at your feed, oh, you know, when, like, when you have small wins. And so sharing small wins where you don't have to ask, and actually we use this a lot with our customers. So I have a whole engagement plan that we execute with our um, customers where we obviously have an account management team, but for the key executives, you know, I basically send a monthly note with an intelligence report that gives them a little update. They don't have to respond or anything, but it keeps them in the loop. And I think there's easy ways to do that with a broader base of investors and you can tier it. And so instead of getting coffee with every investor that you might want to raise from in the future, if you just kind of give them small updates, um, then it's a great use of their time. And do you yours. do it with actual investors and potential investors both? Um, it depends. Yeah. Okay. Well, your quarterly well, actual investors definitely for sure, right? Yeah, so quarterly reports and hers are fantastic. I mean, key metrics, KPIs, wins. The other thing you need is like beautifully presented in a chart every quarter, so you you know how the company's doing. And as soon as you can ask for more money, you feel very confident about somebody who's communicating in that way. Sense. All right. So I know we should wrap up a little bit. But I would love like for for women getting started. Um, what's the best piece of advice you have? Oh, there's so many things. <laughs> well, you had some good points already. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is thinking about the founding team. And um, that's, it's so just hard and building the right advisory board or base or like you're just in your advisory team in the early days and being open to like listening on how you can shape your product or um, the business. And like, uh, you know, I think you don't want to take advice from everyone because sometimes you really have your plan and you know you know what you want to do but like there's ways to tweak your business and kind of get that feedback early on before you fail if like everyone's saying hey something looks off about this business model or something about the market sizing does doesn't seem right like there's pattern recognition if you can figure out how to address those things sooner rather than later um, you can just move faster I think the most valuable thing is time Lauren so um, the best capital is the capital you don't have to raise. So if you can get your, uh, your team to come in and work on sweat equity or work for the way that if you can get a customer to agree to buy from you, at least on milestones or on spec and whatever you can do to get customer or vendor financing and to get your team to work principally for sweat equity or get interns, anything you can do to be virtual and get something to market and get cash as quickly as possible is the best thing you can do for your company. Oh, if you want to be an investor? So, you know, the best thing if you want to be an investor is to join with other women and either networks or angel groups or crowdfundings because it's really hard to do it on your own. I, may, I tried that in the beginning and 
you know, you got to be careful. You have to have a portfolio approach. Otherwise, you're putting it all on black 28. I mean, you know, you've got to, and by the way, I have roulette cufflinks on, right? <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're putting it all on one. You've got to have a portfolio and spread it across and have a risk appetite. And you have to plan to invest a certain amount each year. And, you know, there's classes and places you can go to, like Pipeline and others. There's a lot of good groups out there. But it really takes preparation to be it. But one thing I'd like to say to all women, most of you have in your portfolio something called alternative investments, which when you get your statement, most of you have no clue what it is, right? It's something that you're financial. She's nodding, Bobby, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you could take some of that. And so you're not changing anything, because that's your higher risk in your in portfolio. And you could take that alternative investment money, and you could put it towards investing in women and to get involved in a network or a fund. Um, and begin to learn to do it. And, you, and again, you take a portfolio, you really wanna get, I mean, I'm in 40 companies, I'd like to hopefully get to 100 before I kick the bucket. But the, the more you can do, the more likely you are to be successful. And so you just say, I'm gonna invest a certain amount per year, and I'm gonna build a portfolio of you know, 15, 25 companies, and I'm gonna do it in my community where I can see the impact. I mean, there's some groups here in Austin, but there's not enough women investors here in Austin doing what they, you know, supporting the other women, which is a high growth area. So look at your portfolio with alternatives and consider moving that from one high risk to another, but at least where it has impact to help an underserved uh, segment of the population, because although women get less of the equity funding, we actually outperform and we do it on 35% less capital. <laughs> well, I think that is a great close for the introduction of, oh, I didn't know that they had a mic. Yes. I know you have a, an investor background, but for somebody, let's say, who doesn't, have you reached out to somebody that wasn't in your network already, and how did you go about doing that? Um, yeah, so I can um, rephrase the question. So she said, um, I was previous investor, but if you don't have that background, how do you kind of get introduced and, um, you know, build an investor relationship? So actually, I was in a very different type of investing. So even though I felt comfortable with numbers and stuff, this was like totally different. And so there was a lot of learning. But um, there's, I think this is where accelerators actually help a lot because they come to you. And not only do you not have to find them? These are the ones that are interested in your sector and space. Um, additionally, they kind of plan all the meetings for you because like logistically, like again, it's a time thing. <laughs> like where do you spend your time? Like trying to reach out to people or not? But the other way is warm introduction. So there's so many ways to get plugged in our communities right now where there's, you know, pitch meetups and things and VCs also, you know, their job is to find good deals. So a lot of them are out there, you know, meeting companies, but doing different types of meetups throughout the week. And so, you know, you'd, you'd be surprised like how accessible some of these are, especially when they're in your local areas. And that's like a good way to um, develop the relationship, meet, and then it's um, within the networks. And I, I think the best advice I have is when you're asking for an intro, if you make it really easy for the person you're asking. So if I'm asking Lauren for an intro to someone else, if I could put in my milestones or a very, very short blurb and have a very specific ask and make it like not annoying, you know, <laughs> I think it's really easy. It should be something you can forward. Yeah, with on a, your a phone. quick comments. Oh, she's one of the best ones in our portfolio. You should take a look, click. And then there's the, there's the little blurb she... Yeah. When yeah. you do that, like you can probably like multiply the number of intros you get if you make it look cool, your milestones, like what's good about the team, and it's just really easy to forward, then they think about other people that they want to help you with. And so I think, you know, you want to make it as easy as possible for people helping you. Great. Another question? Uh, Lauren, how would you feel about investing in an entrepreneur who's running multiple businesses? In a what? I'm sorry. An entrepreneur running multiple businesses. Uh, so multiple I've got businesses. two startups, they're both digital marketplaces, one's sustainability working in forestry, one's MarTech working in influencer marketing, very related sort of. <laughs> um, is that deterrent to an investor? Who's well, I mean, you know, look at Elon Musk, right? He's in a bunch of companies. So, I mean, it's possible, but it's the classic investor answer is, we want you to focus. Um, because it's hard to, to do uh, early stage companies and, and we want you to pick the winner. After you're winning, then you can do others. Honest answer. Becca, here.
Well, I have a bias. I'm pro-woman. <laughs> I want to invest in women-led companies. So, you know, they're already a leg up to me. Go ahead, I'll let and you And this answer. is super controversial. And actually, some of my female entrepreneur friends and I, you know, talk about this. Sometimes females are harder to raise from because they also feel like they have something to prove. <laughs> and so, whereas I, I, and I've heard this from people, you know, at the top funds where, for guys, they can say like, oh, but this is my friend, I trust him, it's cool, like, you know, this is good. And yeah, if you know someone, you have a relationship, then you'll trust that they're executing, and that's fine. The diligence process is almost easier, but where there's, you know, female investors, sometimes they feel like they have to prove out more, and so it's even harder, because they don't want to be perceived as the one who's just helping you because you're a woman. And for me, too, like, I prefer it to be merit-based, you know, and so um, I think that's a challenge. That said, I think it's more of where an investor is in his or her career. Lauren's done very, you know, success. She's already successful. She has the confidence. And so I think the issue is, yes, there are more females now in investor roles, but they're not all partners yet. I think it's starting to change, but this is part of the struggle. And so as more and more become more successful that have deals that with strong exits, because when you're an investor, it's not just about the capital. It's like you have your own metrics. How many exits have you had? Um, you know, like how your, how's the track record of your portfolio companies? And so, you know, everyone has their different metrics and I think it's really important to understand. It's a really hard, this is really hard. Um, and there's no perfect answer and I, I wish I knew, but like, it's, it's a hard problem. We need more stories of the success of women funding women. That's part of how you break the, the bias. When, sure. I mean, Springboard, we have, I don't know, a handful of unicorns, right? That's pretty amazing. So when the guys figure out they're missing the good deal, they're, they'll be competing for it. Right now, they, they th think there's not enough deal flow, but there's a ton of deal flow. There's lots of great deals oh, out there. I hate when people say that. Like, uh, oh, I can't find that many female investors. I mean, I was female, told that. Uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah, welcome like, to Dwayne. Like, there's so many. Welcome we'll to Dwayne. You know, everybody really in there is a fundable company. Yeah, or right, then one you go more to question. these parties and they're yeah. all investors. Like half the VC parties I went to, and I won't name the names, but like you, you'd think that they're being sent here to meet with all the amazing women, female entrepreneurs here, right. you go to the parties that are the hardest ones to get into, and it's all investors. They're just hanging out with each other. So I don't understand that. <laughs> like, One Karen, more question. You, Karen, you mentioned knowing um, when to take advice from investors and when to change course or change something about your pitch or about your business model. But I also know that entrepreneurship is sticking true to your guns and being true to yourself and knowing when to ignore that advice. Can you give an example in layman's terms that we might all understand of when you ignored that advice and stayed the course and then also an example of when you took that advice and I'd love to know from you as well Lauren about an, an example of when somebody t chose not to take that advice and what y'all decided or when they totally switched courses and how that worked out um, yeah I'll give you um, a, a good example so um, one the thing with advice is some people just like to talk <laughs> and then <laughs> they just you know and they just like to it's almost like I don't even know if they're listening actually this is like also controversial I actually kicked someone off my board because I felt like he was dominating the conversation we couldn't have a real conversation and make critical decisions and so um, I mean it was a longer story but it was it was hard but um, so I think it's it's a judgment call in terms of do they is this really sound advice do they know your business or you know are they anyways so maybe I shouldn't have said that. Is this recording? Can we take that part out? <laughs> <laughs> so what, 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 one thing I, I will say is in my business, I knew what problem I wanted to solve, and that part was right. Um, there was a lot of things that had to tweak and pivot and all of these things, but one of the things we looked at, we were very early in the market when we started about five years ago um, for looking at different sources of information like influencer social media buzz, Google searches, and, you know, SKU data was, like, obvious. But... Um, I just felt like that was important to being predictive. And I felt like I knew that from our case studies and the modeling, that was important. And also a lot of people said, well, you should just targeting marketing teams because it's easier. But I looked at the marketplace and like, there's so many marketing solutions. I want to build a merchandising solution. So um, 
it was important that we stuck to our guns from that point of view, and now it's paying off because we are differentiated. You know, fast forward now, that's, you know, us having social media where people questioned it is actually a key differentiator versus pricing tools in the market. So in, in our space, like if you know your domain well and what problem you're trying to solve for, but it's truly validated, sometimes it's just, is it a consumer, is it an adoption thing? Like, are you too early for your market? And if so, what's your plan around that? And Laura? So one of the key diligence things is how coachable is the founder and the team? Not that we want them to be wishy-washy, to her point. You've got to stand your ground when you know what you're doing. We want to see that. We want to see you've got a backbone and are persistent. Uh, but yeah, we had some horror stories. It was a company Bell was going to invest in. And at the last minute, things started slowing down like we thought we were going to be signing it. And then at the last minute, she wanted to change the deal. And I'm like, no, we're done. And she's wanted to come back. And I'm like, no, we're done. You, you know, there, there's a line at which you do not cross. You made a deal, you have to honor it. Now you want to change it? Sorry. That's a bit, and it's like, this is the relationship. It's a long-term relationship when you invest in these companies because it might be seven or 10 years before you exit. You got to be really committed to one another. And if you're already starting to do business like that, it's not with integrity. So it's, it's so how somebody is in these interactions is really important. We love pushback because they think, okay, that's a strong entrepreneur. She's confident, she knows what she's doing. She pushed back a lot, it's great. Uh, but at the same time, she wants to be smarter. She is super smart, and she's taking in from everybody like a sponge, and those are like the ideal people to back. So a big round of applause for Karen and Lauren. You guys are fabulous. And thank you, Jill. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, and for Amy. walking the walk. And we'll have Amy's going to introduce the next part of our activity. Thank you. While they're coming down from the stage, I just wanted to once again thank Lauren and Karen. Let's give them another round of applause. That was really insightful. And Trissa, thanks for moderating. Well, there were a couple things that I took away from that. So number one, the power of networks and relationships and really making sure that you're leveraging those. The second was take control of your own destiny. You heard Karen talk about a lot of things that uh, she was very focused on and make, making sure that she had a great plan. And the third thing that Lauren talked a lot about was set yourself up for world domination. I love that. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Amy Millman, the uh, president of Springboard Enterprises, who's also a great friend of Dell. And she's going to talk, tell us about the next part of our event, which is very exciting, the pitch competition. So Amy, over to you. Am I on? Yes, I am. Hi. All right, let's start again. Hello. Hello. All right, so yesterday we were doing a panel and the interesting part was we decided we'd take a picture to show all the other women who were not here what they were missing and so I'm going to ask you to like raise your hands, do something really fun, and make it happen. And it's just going to be a shock. All right, go. Woohoo! All right, good. That's going out to the world. So I'm Amy Millman, and I've had the amazing opportunity of hanging out with this woman sitting on the front front row here, Kay Koplovitz, our unicorn. Uh, Kay started USA Network's cable television. Um, some time ago, and she uh, built it to a $5 billion company. It's now uh, owned within the NBC uh, network. And what, so what was it that I learned from her? I learned it was go big or go home, and that you need to be out there talking about it. You need to understand you've got a network and a village that's going to support you, and you need money to do it. And so what we wanted to do was to engage women in this whole process of raising capital, finding resources, making connections. Entrepreneurship is a really lonely endeavor, and you need a network. So that was what we did about 18 years ago. Lauren gave all the stats and everything. I don't need to repeat them, but the honest is we're dealing with some awesome women on the top of the pyramid, scaling businesses to be billion-dollar enterprises and make an impact. And so today we invited three to come and share their visions and their excitement. And perhaps there's somebody in the audience or many of you who actually know how to make connections for them, have resources, or will invest in them. 
And that's the thing that we've decided. It's a 360 engagement. People with expertise are going to figure out how they can invest either their human capital or their financial capital to help these visionaries, you know, make their dreams come true. All right, are we all in on this? Yeah. Yep, okay, great. So, um, and by the way, just as a little public service announcement for Dell, um, uh, that picture was actually taken in Istanbul at a Dell Women's Entrepreneurship Network. I've decided to keep it for the rest of my life. I don't care how I change and grow over the years, but that's gonna be my picture for the rest of my life. And I thank them and I appeared, at, or maybe it was Austin actually, there was this huge, I walk in the room and there's this huge billboard and there's my face and I'm saying, oh my God. And then I thought, hey, use it, own it. So thank you. Another little added benefit of being part of the Dell network, right? All right, so first one up. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to talk about Owner Listen. Sorry, I always forget this. So Owner Listens actually happens to be a springboard company that has pioneered a way to message your ideas. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff around, but we love this company. And so we're going to give you, for each one of the presenters, um, a, a, you know, a, a way to text them. If you don't get to ask a question, offer a resource, make a comment, or, or anything, make sure that you text them, hey, do you know this company or here's a resource? They're gonna have a particular ask when, when they give their pitch. Here's what we're looking for. Not just the you know, multi-million dollars, which of course they're all looking for, but I need this, I need an access point here, I need to connect somebody here. And you know, I'll give you a quick little story. Um, we were in Cleveland doing one of these programs. We call them dolphin tanks. Actually, Lauren Flanagan made this name up and it just fits uh, when we were doing a program for Dell in Rio. And, and, we, and so we're sitting there and I say, okay, what's your ask? And she says, I need a specific company reference to a company called Bama Foods. And I know this is like, oh, that's a little too specific, right? person at the back of the room raises their hand and says, that's my cousin. And they've been doing business ever since. So uh, you never know what's going to happen. It's a great room. And so we're going to ask these companies to come up, tell about their business, and then have an ask. Okay? Where are the people that are telling me what to do? Ashley, Maria? Yeah. Ashley's, up first. Ashley's up first. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Ashley Crowder. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ventana. We are transforming consumers into brand advocates through mixed reality experiences. Imagine walking down the street of a new city and footprints magically appearing in front of you to lead the way. Or better yet, a giant green arrow above your head so your Uber driver actually knows where to pick you up. This is the power of augmented reality as we never had before. And it's going to change every aspect of our lives from education to engineering and entertainment. Goldman Sachs predicts that it'll be an $80 billion industry by 2025. That's less than 10 years. The problem though, is there's a huge learning curve and cost in creating AR and VR experiences. There's no reliable metrics and there's no integration into existing software platforms. So Ventana has created a platform to easily create interactive hologram experiences with built-in data collection that automatically syncs with your CRM systems to quantify that engagement. Clients like Mercedes are using our technology to leverage endorsement deals. Roger Federer is usually really busy during the open, but we let him play tennis with 8,000 fans, who of course got a video to share, and we increased their engagement by 20%. Or Intel is using us for business communication. We beamed their executive live on stage in Taiwan so his hologram could announce their new processor chip. Or Lexus, we have a hologram car configurator. So with a swipe of your hand, you can pick your color, your rims, your interior. But then I know exactly what car you want. So a two-week installation at the Staples Center turned into a two-and-a-half-year contract in 10 stadiums, and we continue to more than double their qualified leads. Our clients range from Disney to actually Dell and Lacey Maxwell, who put this amazing event on, to a financial institution who leveraged our technology for the first AI hologram bank teller. 
though it knows I'm Ashley Crowder, lets me take out money from my bank account, still tries to upsell me a credit card. Um, <laughs> and so the, the use of this technology is amazing. We've more than doubled revenue every year since we started reaching profitability last year. We have three issued patents, 17 patents pending, and we're looking for CMOs and CTOs who want to wow consumers with frictionless retail experiences and sponsorship activations. Millennials define luxury as an experience, but how do you sell them a product? Gen Z are digital natives who demand the latest and greatest in tech to communicate with them. Mixed reality is the future, and Ventana is the backbone to create, distribute, and quantify that engagement. Thank you. Great. Woohoo! So the most interesting aspect, and we'll ask you what your ask is in a couple of minutes, but but the most interesting aspect of this is that a lot of people really like to talk about the product, but not necessarily about how it's used. And your your use cases and, and the customers that you've had are pretty amazing. Is there something that you find about what they see about your product, maybe before that gets them to do it, or after when they see it in actuality and the impact? Talk about the impact of this a little more. Yeah, so you know, for us, when we first started, we're like, we're doing holograms, it's Princess Leia, and people would come into our office, they're like, this is amazing, what do I do with it? Yeah. Um, so for us, the built-in data collection is our secret sauce. We are the only hologram company with data collection, and, and that's the difference. So yes, all of the brands want to engage consumers, but if you can't quantify that, if you can't collect their information and act on that, then you're not contributing to sales, and the bottom line is what matters. Yeah. So it, you know, it, that impact aspect of it is really critical. You know, and and so we always talk about differentiation. What is it about what you're doing? Is it a nice to have? Is it a need to have? But with things changing so much, where do you see the business next? What do you see the next phase? Yeah, well, um, we actually uh, are display agnostic. So while we have our own hardware that projects holograms, our software platform can be used on other AR, VR devices like HoloLens, Magic Leap. And so, you know, we're excited for the future when everyone has a headset at home and our software platform will still be powering that content. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we also plan to open up our platform so our clients can create their own content, um, which will really help us scale. And I'm just excited to see what people mm -hmm. create. And will there be a time when we don't have to have headsets? I mean, is there going to be like uh, s something implanted in us or, uh, or uh, you know, new type of glasses or whatever? Yeah, I mean, Intel just released some really great glasses. Uh, they're, they're a client of ours, um, and, and they look more like regular glasses. And I mean, I'm excited for, you know, when light field technology is really here. You, you know, it will be the Princess Leia mm -hmm. hologram, um, and our, our platform will still power that interactive content. You know, it's kind of interesting when my, my son became a teenager and he would talk to me, I would not want to be looking at him. And so I used to hold out a, a, you know, a picture of him when he was two and I loved him. And I wonder if I, <laughs> if I, had, if I had glasses, you know, that basically allowed me to think of him in that term, you know, that would have been really fabulous, you know, wonderful yeah. time that used to happen when he was just a child. So what keeps you up at night? Um, I mean, for, for us, we, we've been scaling quickly. Um, we really are looking to meet those CMOs and CTOs who are really trying to transform that retail experience or that consumer experience. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of our number one ask. Um, we are planning to expand to uh, New York soon. We're based in LA. We have tons of clients in New York. Um, we do want a, you know, a lead sales biz dev person. That seems to be the hard person to find, as you heard earlier. Let's say that again. OK, a, repeat a, that a out so they know. Business development sales uh, VP um, in New York is, is really kind of our next big hire. All right, so here you're like my honorary dolphins in here, or, or anything, questions or comments or resources. Over here. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Um, so you said that your secret sauce is in the data collection, um, and you talked about, so um, walk me through, if you have the installation at Staples Center and people are swiping through and customizing the car, how do you get the unique identifier, like so that Lexus can then reach out to that unique 
person. Yeah, so um, we joke, we've invented all this tech and we're doing selfies. That's what people want. So they get to see their hologram live in the car, with the car. Um, we have facial recognition built in, so we know your age, gender, and sentiment just by you interacting. Um, and then so you can get your video, you are giving your email so you okay. can get that back. Yeah. Okay, so through email. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you have like an input field. Yeah, or we've, we've integrated with RFID badges mm -hmm. at events like this. You can just scan your badge. Um, we've done beacons. Uh, it depends. Cool. And Thank you. So, what, so what's your expertise that, that makes you interested in this? So we do a similar tech, well, we don't do a similar technology, but we do uh, a similar service through um, large interactive display technology. So not holograms, but um, people who install um, the screens on site. And our secret sauce is also in the ability to display data, unique software that can do facial recognition and can target that person mm -hmm. and say like, oh, this person wants to see this type of content. So, so is this a collaboration maybe? Oh yeah, we have so much in common. <laughs> yeah, Great. very cool. Um, anybody else have a K? I, I, gotcha. I was curious about the, um, the sports uh, reference that you made and having people in, in the stands for play a game and play against Roger Federer <laughs> in tennis. I'm a, I'm a t big tennis person. So I'm wondering, um, who among like the different sports leagues or something that would be interesting to you uh, to actually introduce that, your technology or have you been able to introduce across the board of different leagues, different sports and so forth? I'm just wondering what would be your favorite? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've seen the the brands who sponsor stadiums are really our clients. Um, so, you know, teams and leagues love the technology. They're not necessarily going to be the ones to pay for it. But Lexus has courtside clubs in a lot of stadiums. And they've paid for their name there, but they have no idea what that real engagement is. And so they've seen value in putting these experiences. Um, Roger was at the U.S. Open for Mercedes-Benz. You know, they sponsored, they had the sign, um, but with this experience, we could really capture data, engage people, get them sharing on social. Um, so any brand sponsors at events and, and specifically sports has been great. So Kay is the founder of Madison Square Garden Sports that actually presented the first streaming content, the thriller from Manila. And uh, that not only put her on the map, put everything on the map, changed life for all of us. Uh, and so yeah, we'd we actually did a Lexus hologram at Madison Square Garden last year for just like a month. So I'd love to talk with you more about that. Great. And then we have sitting here, um, hello, Alice. Um, we have Elizabeth Gore here who has a network for talent engagement um, as well as expertise and whatever. And uh, uh, Maria, why don't you get, oh, look who's here, Carolyn Rose too. So the whole, the, the hello, Alice crew is here in force. Everybody ought to know Hello Alice and be on it, right? Yes. That would... <laughs> yes. Uh, oh. That's right, Bell Company. So, yes. we, you know, it's like this 360, it is. very that incestuous one. group of all of us that we're trying to make a big tent, right? We'll always be nice to each other. Uh, yes, we did. Um, Signia Ventures, S-I-G-N-I-A. They are becoming the biggest funders in ARVR. Um, they're our li biggest funder at Alice, and uh, Zoth, that um, is, I want to connect you all because Thank um, you. if you go through another round of funding, they would be great, but also I think he has all the connections you're looking for, um, and he loves supporting women-owned also, so we'll make that connection. Thank and you yes, so much. Everyone. I will. <laughs> Two million last year and six this year. Thank you, Lauren. All right. Yes. Can and, we do and a, jump can we, on helloalice.com. We'll help you. Yeah, I will. Raise all your money. <laughs> can you do a, just a quick public service on Hello Alice yes. while we're here? Um, so Alice is an artificial intelligence uh, social enterprise, and we help women, minority, and veteran founders scale their companies. Um, it is a free service for all founders. Uh, we also help ecosystem builders like Springboard and like Dwen um, help their constituents and their founders. So. Um, Carolyn is the founder sitting right here and Dell has been our biggest partner to help us as a women owned minority owned company get off the ground. So uh, check out helloalice.com. Woohoo. Great. Um, over here. 
Hi, um, so it's interesting that you're able to do this um, virtual, virtual reality and everything for cars. Who are you? Sorry, Natalie Merrick, um, co-founder of an organic sipping tequila called Tequila Sheila. And so I'm just curious if there's ever a research being done about being able to get consumers to try um, or experience foods and beverages without actually having to um, consume them. <laughs> Um, a little bit. I would say uh, we are talking with someone about being able to like take a shot with Blake Shelton in Vegas um, and things like that experiences. I think food, um, you know, you can do the smells, you know, you can have like a 4D experience, but I, I don't know. And, and we're starting to like integrate haptics. So like feel, but I think taste is still something that you don't, it's not virtual yet. How are you going to put aroma and smells into what you do at some point? Um, I mean, we can do it, but most of the time it's not very applicable, but with this, you know, a drink company it is, and that's more like making sure it, it's that mixed reality experience. You have the, the actual drink as well as the virtual person you're interacting with or, you know, whatever that experience is. It's like walking down the street in Chicago and you're walking by a store and all of a sudden you have this incredible need to go and buy popcorn. And it's because they're, they're streaming out this smell and you don't realize it, but just God, I'd really like some popcorn. You realize there's the store. So yeah. I mean, how powerful is that? Yeah. Or a hologram can be knocking on the window telling you to come in. That, isn't that, that's a little creepy, but yeah. <laughs> right. I can, I can sort of see little Laurens everywhere saying, oh, I invested in all of these, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I can handle one hologram of her, but not, or the real, but not the hologram. Right. So anybody else, suggestions, comments, questions, who she should know? Oh, Joshua Henderson. People are thinking about and texting you, uh, contacts, CMO, CTO, people they're thinking of. Can you talk about maybe your top two or three verticals? You're, you're, you're expanded across many, but we've talked about sports, food and beverage. Can you hit on where you're seeing the greatest potential or greatest traction? Yeah, uh, sports sponsorship is one of our largest. So um, any brand sponsoring stadiums, teams, Super Bowl. Um, we also do a lot uh, with studios launching new TV shows or film, um, especially to engage consumers at VidCon, Comic-Con, you know, South by Southwest. We have a client here. Um, any of these types of pop culture events where you're really trying to create an experience for consumers. Um, so those are our, our two largest. Great. So every, oh, back here. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm owner of Fire and Ice Entertainment, which is like a Cirque du Soleil for specialty events. Have you done live and virtual events together where the, they're actually experiencing both at the same time? Yeah, so the, the Intel was a great example. We um, beamed his hologram live on stage, talking with a real person on stage live, interacting. We can do less than one second delay from LA to Korea. Um, and then we, you know, another type that's live and interactive, we had a hologram karaoke for Disney. Um, so for Descendants 2, the star from Descendants 2 was a hologram, and fans got to go up and sing with her on stage and get a video, um, like, performing next to her. So it's all about the real and the, and the digital. Awesome. Is that something you can work together on? Yeah, I'd love to contact you. Yeah, we'd love Closing to talk with you. Show, so. Great. That'd be awesome. um, all right, so I'm going to, since uh, you have more? Yeah, so um, we rent or sell our hardware and provide a software license. Um, we're actually moving towards an enterprise SaaS software model that's display agnostic. So um, a cruise line in Europe, for example, they bought one hologram. They licensed our software for the whole year to use not only on our hardware, but other AR, VR hardware. Um, so we work any way you would like. <laughs> right. So, so I have... To remind everybody who did not have a referral or a question or a suggestion to text her, I mean, you can email her, but you know, we're in, you know, in the 21st century here. So text, text some ideas or somebody she should know, or maybe they should know you. And uh, uh, you, that'll make it a lot easier for you to connect right after this. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you. Appreciate it.
All right, Samantha. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. I have a magic mic. She's already connected. What if I told you that this cup I just stole from the bar behind you could be transformed? Transformed into an upper limb prosthetic or a lower limb prosthetic that could then be cast into metal? What if it could be transformed into an artificial coral reef or a plane that could fly? These are just a couple examples and applications that we see our customer and community thinking about every day. Hi, I'm Samantha. I'm an Air Force Reservist on the weekend and the co-founder and catalyst for Re3D during the week, where we're addressing the two biggest barriers constraining 3D printing, and that's cost and scale. So in 2013, we launched here at South by Southwest on Kickstarter and launched our flagship technology called the Gigabot. You may have seen some around the parties over the last five years. Gigabot is 30 times bigger than a desktop printer, but a fraction of the cost of an industrial system because it starts at just under $10,000. We're pleased to announce that we now offer full service solutions around Gigabot, whether you're an enterprise trying to figure out how 3D printing fits into your workflow, if you're looking at doing contract printing, or you want white glove installation and training. We're now in 53 countries and have done almost $5 million in post- large-scale industrial 3D printing, we're not stopping there. At the core of Re3D is a social enterprise. We're relentlessly committed to impact. We have a one-for-100 one model whereby we give away one printer for every 100 we deliver. To someone trying to make a difference in their community, we'd love to invite any of you to be the judge of our next competition. And going a step further, we want to continue to decimate that accessibility barrier to 3D printing. How are we doing that? Well, we're modifying Gigabot to directly be able to accept reclaimed plastic. That's right, trash where 80% of it is untouched worldwide. And I'm, unfortunately, the most manufacturing companies are some of the biggest offenders. How is that trash getting into the ocean? We want to give you guys a solution. And this isn't just a pipe dream. Our team of NASA scientists, technologists, machinists, and assembly technicians have the knowledge and know-how to make this a reality, along with our outstanding advisors from Silicon Valley. And we're doing it. Thanks to the support that some of you provided in our pitch competitions and our NSF SBIR, we're pleased to announce that we have modified a version of Gigabot to accept pelletized plastic waste. So we're looking to you. We want to attract beta users. We want to invite you to see Gigabot Live at the WeWork activation down on Congress. We also would love for you to share our Kickstarter campaign. It's called Gigabot X. It launched on Friday from South by Southwest. This is your opportunity to help us find beta users so that in 12 to 18 months, we can all come together and truly enable sustainable and locally driven manufacturing. Thank you. So you told us a little bit when we were talking earlier about your background and where you came from. So yes, talk about you a little bit here so sure. we get an idea of where this brilliance came from. Sure. So I, um, I am an Air Force Reservist. Um, I've always wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, and because of that, after I sold a DARPA-funded technology I co-invented in my 20s, I was asked to join NASA as a strategist and was volunteering in Engineers Without Borders, NASA Johnson Space Center, with some brilliant people. And as we traveled around the world, we saw four things. We saw high unemployment, a huge dependence on imported goods and the frustration that went along with that. We also saw that there was um, a real innovation in the people that we met. So with that in mind, our team of NASA scientists and engineers decided to quit our jobs. We started to share this concept online of a toilet-sized 3D printer that could be powered by waste. Um, we got a lot of followings and um, Launched our company in Chile, where the government of Chile gave us 40000 equity free to start our company. And fast forward through crowdfunding and through pitch competitions and the support of individuals like yourself, we've been able to remain bootstrapped and to grow with a community of problem solvers. So what, what has actually happened in Chile, you know, with your, what have they done with it? How has it worked? Um, and what's happened because of it? Yeah, so... Startup Chile was an amazing opportunity um, to basically allow me, uh, just coming off of my time at NASA um, headquarters as a social entrepreneur in residence, with just an idea in my head. Um, it gave us the resources to do the prototype that then we launched at the Startup Chile booth and the inter interactive exhibit at South by Southwest eight weeks later. That gave us a, we were found, crowdfunded in uh, 27 hours, uh, thanks to a shout out from tech. Major, major media coverage for the campaign we just launched with the printer that's being powered by Reclaim Pallets. Um, and that exposure then gave us a quarter of a million. Um, so it allowed us to bootstrap a factory in Houston, Texas. We're across from Johnson Space Center. And allowed us to meet a very global community. Um, 
as a follow-up to that, after winning a pitch competition this summer that we got to compete in with Maggie, uh, we had the opportunity to, um, we were invited by the Puerto Rican government to stand up an outpost in Puerto Rico. We think that a technology like ours has a huge opportunity in an island nation where you can truly pilot a circular economy. So knowing that we were going to make this happen and, and have the prototype that we finished now, the Puerto Rican government gave us $40,000 to stand up there, very similar to we, as we did in um, Chile. And unfortunately, we endured Hurricane Harvey in our factory in Houston and then Irma and Maria in Puerto Rico oh, and just man. dug in further. And um, now there's a lot of plastic water bottles sitting on the island not a recycling facility, and we just feel like we're in the right place, the right time to work alongside not just the innovative Chileans and the Latin American community we originally started with five years ago, uh, but the Puerto Rican community, which has a huge manufacturing nexus and a lot of big brands worldwide. I mean, who would have thought you could make sort of omelets out of eggs on that situation? So, so you're in Houston, Carolyn, so this is a real opportunity of proximity, at least, and Carolyn's got this unbelievable network globally, so uh, uh, I'm hoping you're, uh, you guys are going to connect on this. <laughs> yes, we, we must connect in Houston and talk through media uh, connections and lots of different right. things, so we'd love to follow up. That would be so huge. Um, we just grew out of a garage last summer, full disclosure. Uh, due to the hurricanes, we're still in the process of renovating um, our former employer, Wiley Integrated in Sciences, building across from Jackson. feet foot of window front. We've done the back end. We've set up a proper factory. Uh, per uh, a la carte, like brewery style, we've cut windows through the... Um, window openings through the walls, and we're ready to start hosting meetups. We want to be a fixture in the Houston community as well as our presence here in Austin and San Juan. So um, if anyone's a designer and wants to help us uh, polish up that front end, we'd love to collaborate. But more importantly, when people come to Houston, Texas, we want them to take a tour of Johnson Space Center and then come take a workshop and learn about 3D printing at our factory. Uh, well, one follow-up thing is to get you connected with Houston Exponential and all that they're doing, because um, they're working with NASA as well, so it'd be a great partnership to get. It would be fabulous. Doing and help support those meetups as well. Great. Thank you. So, Samantha, what keeps you up at night? What is the big challenge, you think? So, um, we are open source, bootstrapped, and flamboyantly socially driven. <laughs> um, and I think in the traditional business context, that might seem like it's present, it presents a number of um, challenges. For us, we believe that you can do good and do well. Um, you know, but when you're always hustling and you're really scrappy, you work on discounted salaries. It wasn't until recently when we won an award through WeWork that um, we had the opportunity to have healthcare. Um, so we've been really heads down. Thanks to uh, the WeWork visibility and the bunker community and, and Hello Tomorrow, we now have the resources to, to get out of zombie mode and to go a step further. Um, but we're hiring. I don't know how to hire for sales and quality control and some of those next level positions that we need on our team. So if you know that someone that's still willing to work a little bit below market value in Houston, <laughs> Austin, or, or Puerto Rico, um, please reach out. Um, but it's, finding time to do that is really difficult. Also, as, as we've hit scaling, um, we're looking for a lot of mentorship. Uh, recently, I, I had 782 emails in one day. I can only stay up. And partnerships with organizations um, in Fortune 100s worldwide. So we're looking for support. I need your advice. I need your introductions. Um, so cloning, when cloning is not an answer at this point, who's got some suggestions based on their experience of what they've, uh, what they've seen uh, on how to tackle that, that, those issues? I know you've all been through it. Um, Lauren, I know you do. Yeah, you lost your opportunity. Sorry, Lauren. Hi, I'm Felicity with Stratus, and I'll be in your hot spot in a minute. But one of the things that we did early on is looked for strategic partners who were really excited about what we were doing and in a kind and considerate and professional way poached some people who were done at other organizations um, and believed in what we were doing enough to leave corporate to come into a startup. Um, we were exceptionally successful with that in some spaces, less so in others. Um, but the other thing that we did is we looked for startups who were tangential to us, where we could increase our whole by partnering and bring those people into those things that maybe aren't your core competencies. 
I really appreciate that. Um, I know there's been a little bit of movement in the additive manufacturing space in the last couple of months. If you know of anyone with 3D printing experience that touches upon uh, many of the points that you made, we'd, we'd love to chat with them. So Fel Felicity, um, were you the one who said you were gonna look at, at doing B Corp work? You were becoming a B Corp at some point? Oh, so that's another opportunity that um, uh, gives you another network of people who are interested in the success of your companies on this double and triple bottom line approach. Back there. I uh, encourage you in the area, I live in your area. <laughs> um, I would encourage you to reach out to the students in that area. 3D printing is massively popular in the schools. There's actually a child um, just down the street from you, Nassau Road One, that uh, in fourth grade got her college scholarship by uh, creating something with 3D printing. She's the first a uh, person in her family <laughs> to go to college that has a guarantee. We want to meet her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of kids there that will work, you know, minimum wage um, because they're needing the job readiness skills, but just don't discount them because of their age. Uh -huh. um, I could help you with those connections. Thank you very much. Bye. They are really un they have Say a that hard again. Time. Say that again. Military spouses, they have a really hard time to find jobs because they move around and people don't want to hire them. But you know, I can connect you with yeah. somebody who resources those. And if you get that as a program, since you're yourself a reservist, I think you would like that. And you can have them be actual and then virtual and then have them replace themselves as they are relocated. That's an outstanding idea. Thank okay. you. Yeah, so how about Ping Fu? Uh, I know, one of our own people, this. 3D printing pioneer, you must perhaps know who Ping is, but she right. might have some. So Ping was actually the founder of the software that actually enabled 3D printing. Right. When she was at Bell Labs and started a company called Geomagic, which then sold to an actual 3D printer manufacturer. Um, she's in LA and uh, I think she'd love what you're doing. Actually, she, she now spends a lot of time in her wonderful retirement um, uh, creating jewelry and shoes. If you, you look at her, she wears 3D printed shoes everywhere. And um, I think Karen Moon was wearing a really great uh, necklace if you saw that earlier that was 3D printed. So, I mean, there's so much opportunity now. I would love an introduction to her and if she can help us get some major press coverage of that. Okay. Well, Kay knows her really well, so uh, we'll do that. Jennifer. And I will happily introduce you to my sister who's the Chief Strategy Officer at USAA oh, yeah. for Spouses of Military because they're always looking for opportunities and for startups. Uh -huh. Thank Great. you. Um, Sarah. I love it, how long-standing B Corp. So this really wants to learn more about B Corp, and wants to be connected. You? Sarah Enline, I'm a springboard company founder and chief writer of Sweet Riot in New York City. Chocolate. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting about B Corp is it's not just a stamp, it's definitely a community. There is a major convening, a global convening each year. There are regional, international convenings of B Corps and they're people that really look out for each other, similar to Spring Recommended. And Thank you. Have you have any, all right, well, there's it for later. I have a lot of open tabs right now. <laughs> this, is better, this is better than Google. She's the big chief evangelist for B Corps. Um, there was somebody back here. Hi, hi Samantha. I'm Lori Felker Jones, and I'm also a female founder um, of Juicebox Hero, and we've met previously. But um, for you and for other folks, um, I was similarly looking for a space for female founders when I first got started. And long story short, someone said, if you build it, we'll come. And we're more than 300 female founders here in Austin, Texas, expanding to Houston and other cities. And so there are technical resources, funding opportunities, and also a community to complain of like, I've been up for too many <laughs> nights in a row and I have kids or spouses or friends that I haven't seen. Um, the emotional support, but also the technical resources for high growth oriented women in business. So um, I want to invite you themselves or also for deal flow for investment. There, no, nope. no. Nope. Anybody else? Good at the order? Something she ought to know? Something you want to know? Can I throw out one? Yeah. I was told not to get too technical, but if you were a big brand and you're willing to pay to have your plastic waste pelletized, we would learn there might be some synergy. Sounds like Dell is perfect for this one. <laughs> Trissa, you get right on that one. Got her card right here in my pocket. <laughs> We're in business. I have one. Great. Hi, First. Her. My name is Michelle Poole, and I have a company called Coaching for Good. And we do leadership coaching. We have a coaching collective, a huge network of coaches. 
and also social entrepreneurial. So I'd love to extend that to you and I'll reach out. That'd be super helpful. Um, we do pro bono work, especially for great causes that touch our heart. So, great. Thank you. Thank you. You're fabulous. Thanks. Okay, next up, Felicity. All right, I have the just in case mic, so I'm going to sit right here. Yeah. Have you been to Disney World lately? I have three children, so I've been. And after packing all three kids, and maybe my husband, uh, I found myself um, a little flustered getting in the car, getting on the plane, getting to Florida, and as I stood in line to check in, realized that the handy packet, everything that I had. So I learned something in that moment, thing you wanna do. If you've been to Disney lately, you've had a magic band, a band they put on your wrist, and you don't need your wallet, or paper tickets, or frankly, much of anything else. They gave one to me, they gave one to all three of my kids, I had a thing you want to. Gary. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, that credit card bill leader, um, they created an experience for me with that magic band that absent that packet, I couldn't have created myself. And Stratus provides that experience in student housing. When you walk onto a Stratus property, you don't need a key. You never have to adjust your thermostat. You don't need to worry about leaks or lighting. Everything in your apartment becomes known and it comes to know you. Also scary, but also fun. As a property owner or manager, this means a dramatic increase in your operating efficiencies. And in multifamily and student housing, a dramatic increase in your operating efficiencies means an increase in the valuation of your portfolio. Our focus is on the property owner or manager. We've done $2 million of recurring revenue in the last year and installed in 200,000 apartments and student housing units across the United States and launched in Japan. I'm Felicity Mormon. I started GE's Emerging Technologies Division for their consumer and home electronics products, but found only about 18 months of non-entrepreneur in myself. So that said, uh, started Stratus with my co-founder, and we are just opening a Series A, and we are looking for real estate investment trusts and property owners and managers with whom to partner to install our technology. Thank you. Great. Woohoo! So for me, this is smart cities, smart living cities, IOT on steroids. Absolutely. The bigger picture, we really jumped into the multifamily space and the student housing space for traction. There was a pent up demand there. Um, who has used a hard credential in hospitality in the last 20 years? So a key. It's, it's infrequent to use a key today at a hotel. It's more frequent even now that you'll use your phone and bypass check-in altogether. And so that experience is being recreated via pent-up demand in multifamily and student housing. Two times a year, student housing goes from one set of students to another set of students. Two times a year, they have to account for every single credential they have ever put into the hands of a student. Imagine that mess. So we have an immediate return on investment as soon as we engage a student housing property. That first turn is a complete payback on their actual investment. The other thing that we did that I think is extremely important and specifically with regards to smart cities is we have priced this disruptively low. Johnson, Seaman, Schneider aren't gonna touch us. We see pop-ups every day, but those pop-up startups are really just creating smart homes within apartments. We're really addressing the infrastructure of the building. So from your time at GE to your time starting this, how did you how did you pick a platform in which to build this on? Or did you build it from scratch? Yeah, so we, we did build the software from scratch. I got a phone call from a billionaire, which doesn't happen to me every day. And um, he said to me, this was, I was, uh, I am the CEO of a hardware company as well. Stratus is specifically focused on software. And he said to me, I've taken apart this thermostat and inside is your name. And I said, yeah, I did that. Uh, so we had co-created <laughs> one of the leading smart thermostats, not Nest, 
uh, one of the leading smart thermostats in the industry. And inside, just to be a little bit cheeky, we put our brand on it because we white label. We're not really uh, the known entity in that engagement. And so this man, a billionaire, had gone and installed smart apartments across 10,000 units. That's his portfolio in the Northeast. And when he couldn't control them, don't ask, when he couldn't control them for the residents, uh, he took one apart to find out what was wrong with it. And what was wrong with it was my name was inside of it and he got my phone number and called me. Um, and so he said, why can't I control these thermostats? I wanna make sure my residents are hot and I wanna make sure my buildings are efficient. And I installed all these thermostats. Why can't I control them? And I'm like, well, sir, what are you trying to control them with? Nothing, crickets. And so there was no software platform of smart thermostats. That didn't exist in the marketplace. And I said, sir, really, the thermostat is working exactly as it ought. What you're missing is software to control those, those thermostats in those units. And you should do so collaboratively so you don't irk your residents. And he said, okay, well, make that for me. So I'm a hardware person. Like my, my background is in RFID, so Z-Wave, Zigbee, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, determining which protocols match business cases best. I said, that's really not my gig. And he's like, do you need some money? And I don't know who ever said no to that question. <laughs> Except Karen, where are you? I could learn a lesson because I said yes. <laughs> yes, I do need some money. Um, and he very promptly said, if you will control these thermostats, I will pay you in advance for them. Tremendous opportunity. And now we weren't software people, so my co-founder and I were riding a bus and lamenting how we would ever create software. And um, we met a former Googler who had kind of burnt out at Google. Nine years he'd worked on a project and it hadn't shipped. And so when we met him, he said, you know, I'm a, I'm a woodworker now, for real. And um, I said, well, maybe you should just kind of keep your skills up to date. You know, just come in a couple days a week. And he's like, uh, all right, I'll come in a couple days a week, but don't pay me. And I'm like, well, that's not a problem, I can't. Um, we didn't pay us that much money. Um, billionaires don't become billionaires because they throw their cash around, by the way. Uh, every, every literal penny. Um, and so, so he, this Googler really sat down with us and for all intents and purposes, co-founded Stratus, uh, built an architecture beyond anything that the industry had ever seen, both in property management, but certainly in the controls industry where we would have competitors, Johnson, Siemens, and Schneider, were they willing to do so? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mentioned before that we work with an Australian-based company, uh, uh, called uh, Switch Automation that was doing commercial buildings yep. and that engagement on Internet of Things and smart buildings combining, you know, with, with a good database and a good uh, uh, way to track, um, you know, any of that. How is that? Is there a differentiation between yeah. that? Absolutely. So the biggest differentiator between our product and any other product in the marketplace is that we provide collaborative controls for the resident and the property owner. Mm -hmm. A property owner in the multifamily or student housing space has a very competitive market that they're addressing. In other words, renting a, a unit can be done in dozens of properties for every individual. There are dozens of property that match the demographic of that person almost without a doubt. So it's very competitive. And to recruit and retain residents is one of the most challenging pieces of multifamily. So you never want to make your residents uncomfortable. Our apps provide collaborative control for your property manager to focus on building wide efficiencies, vacant units, and that moment of turn in student housing but also provides your resident a traditional smart home app. So if you think of Comcast Xfinity or Vivint, these are companies that provide smart homes in the single family space today. We can always do commercial buildings, but our focus has been on this unique niche because mm -hmm. in order to scale a property, to scale our product, um, it's been integral for us to have something that no one can touch. Sounds like there's a great synergy though, so I'm, I'm gonna yeah. work this out. So what keeps you up at night? Uh, right now, what keeps me up at night is balancing the demands of a Series A uh, with running the business. Uh, we all wear in entrepreneur land, I'm gonna guess a dozen hats each. And I've found that upon opening the Series A, we have a lot of interest and that's very exciting. How much money are you raising? Um, about $4 million. We've been pushed on it to raise more, but we did this quite nearly bootstrapped. 
So we're very lean. So you didn't use the, the dreaded term conservative, did you? We, no. Good. No. Never do that. But I don't are, ever want to hear from anybody the word conservative. No, we are capital conscious. You know, we do, we do more last year without paying for a single um, conference. I spoke at 22. So we don't pay to play and I don't find value in those opportunities anyway. Um, yeah, baby. <laughs> uh, I'm here today because I spent an hour this morning mentoring um, new entrepreneurs and especially those in the IOT. And that hour provided me the badge to be here today or else I wouldn't. And also you wanted to be at Women Funding Women um, talking, right? Well, that was a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what, you picked me? Because I saw the other people. Well, Samantha, she's an astronaut. Okay, yeah. not yet, but she can be. Um, that's a big deal. I want to be an astronaut. Yeah. Come on. I uh, can't do that one. Like so other, so the, other than the four million or however much you're going to pull in, what, what other asks? What are the other things that actually would help you sort of solve whatever those things that keep you up? So there are 30 million apartments in the United States and another 22 that we're addressing in Japan. That's a huge market, but it's exceptionally fragmented. I could almost guarantee that everybody in here knows somebody who is either part of a real estate investment trust that has a multifamily portfolio within it or is owning or managing properties. Uh, think of Graystar, has 440,000 units under management. I already know that one. But um, Blackstar has, Blackstone has a portfolio of um, 150,000 units under the LiveCore brand. If you know him, I really appreciate an intro. Um, so those are the things. And we focus on larger portfolios because we're a startup. So think 10,000 plus units. If it's Bob, your uncle, who has a 10 unit place in New York, maybe skip that one. Mm -hmm. So who's got some ideas or thoughts or in Lauren? I want your card, I want to see your deck. You got it. I want your card, I want to see your deck. Two times. Not really, I don't do that. Carolyn. Yeah, I have a um, contact with someone who leads multifamily um, marketing initiatives across the country and has amazing relationships, so I'd love to That's connect with you. That's what I'm looking two. for, That's yeah. So Great. marketing people in multifamily are looking for ways to retain and recruit their residents. So that's a tremendous opportunity for me. Thank you. Great. Anybody else in, back, in the back there? Um, may I point out another investor right here, Trish Costello, Portfolio, unbelievable, hundreds and hundreds of women entrepreneurs and angels that are now investing seriously. Yeah. <laughs> So, and important, just to uh, mention, portfolio is, is how you- Portfolio can, with an A. Portfolio is how you can put in, uh, as an investor, $10,000 in a fund, and we spread it across six to nine wow. really top companies. Um, nearly all of them uh, run by women. So if you're interested in that, see Phenomenal. me later. Um, but uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm also interested in seeing your deck for the Series A. Um, and Thank tell you. me a little bit about the, the sales cycle. Um, with this and also what does it cost to turn over uh, a multi-family building from the traditional to uh, ready for you? Yep. So this may be the most exciting part. We don't have a sales team and 200,000 units in two years is the same pace at which Comcast Xfinity, which is in my backyard, Philadelphia, installed their Comcast Xfinity home automation system. So we're pacing with Comcast with no sales team. They love it when I say that. If anybody here is from Comcast, hey guys. Um, so, so our sales cycle is based on uh, our distributor network. We have over 300 distributors in the United States alone who actively sell our platform, not in order to receive funds from us in any capacity, but so that they can sell higher margin hardware. So think thermostat salespeople who have traditionally sold a $30 thermostat now get to sell a $150 thermostat and they get to do it not once or five times or even 10 like commercial buildings but 300 units at a time so they're very much incentivized to sell that product in but learn about and sell our platform as well so that the property manager doesn't call the thermostat maker and ask them why they can't control the smart thermostats um, so our sales cycle we are our, our um, Product is paid for immediately upon purchase, so we receive full uh, annual fees up front. 
Um, and and that's, uh, that's great. Those 200,000 units were sold in with one product, primarily. Uh, we are partnering with six additional groups today. So we anticipate the opportunity to multiply that number, that ARR by six, uh, as we ramp those companies. So those companies are Comcast, uh, they are Samsung, they are the major players in the smart industry for home automation products who see the value of multifamily. Second Great. question. Any other last minute for the good of the order? Um, back there, Lauren, one more. So I just made an aside, but I thought I'd share it. What you just described as your go-to-market partners, that's what world domination looks like if they execute well. Amen. Great. That's our, our primary focus for 2018 is creating the opportunity for our sales partners to execute well. We don't have a sales team, but we do have a VP of Strategic Alliances who crushes. So world domination. Um, absolutely 100% world domination. I would like to increase um, the operating efficiencies of properties across the globe. It's why we launched in Japan with the number one cable provider right. in Japan. And um, I would like to, our social mission and our environmental mission, while we don't get the opportunity to speak about them often enough, um, we can today, if we could pull a trigger and install our technology today, we could decrease the energy usage in multifamily and student housing by 15 to 20% overnight. That's something we need to do from the smart side. Right. I wonder if you can monetize that. The next thing is how much are yes, we talking yes. about? Yeah, it's pretty significant. So Come up with a number. Yeah, I'm on it. Yeah, all right. Well, and we're going to Tokyo next, right? Trissa, so uh, Let's go back. come on, come on, plan better. come on with us. Women funding okay. women in Tokyo it's in an another month. It's place for a female entrepreneur, let me tell you. Great. Well, in a lot of ways. Thanks. We, Thank we really you. needed to hear that. Thanks so much. Thank don't forget, don't you forget to, to text them at Owner Listens with uh, any Thank suggestions you. that you haven't been able to mention here. And uh, I think this is the end of this fabulous time. And uh, I want to, before Bobby gets up here and sort of does her thing, I just wanted to thank all of you for being here, Thank for doing you. what you're doing. Uh, make sure that if you're interested in Springboard, SB dot co sb dot co gives you everything hello alice portfolio bell vc and then of course <laughs> you need to know about the ultimate global network dwen d w e n uh dell women's entrepreneur network uh, we're partners in crime and we're doing amazing stuff for women thank you Samantha and Felicity for sharing your, the stories of your businesses with us today. Um, that was amazing and inspiring and it was really exciting sitting up here and just watching this um, interaction and women helping women. Um, I would really like to also uh, again thank Lauren Flanagan and Karen Moon for sharing their, uh, their stories and their insights with us. And a huge thank you to Amy Millman and the Springboard team. This event would not have been possible today without the hard work and dedication of the whole Springboard team. And you know, Amy's uh, passion for women and women-owned business owners is incredible. And I hope that that was really motivating for you today. And we really appreciate Amy taking her time and uh, sharing her expertise with us as well. So we've got um, some more time for networking, which I hope you'll take advantage of. Thank you all for being here today and uh, look forward to seeing you again.